Chapter 4. What is the right libertarian position on private property? Right libertarians are not interested in eliminating capitalist private property and thus the authority, oppression, and exploitation which, go which goes with it. It is true that they call for an end to the state, but this is not because they're concerned about workers being exploited or oppressed, but because they don't want the state to impede capitalists' freedom to exploit and oppress workers even more than is the case now. They make an idol, uh, idol of private property and claim to defend absolute unrestricted property rights, i.e. that property owners can do anything they like with their property as long as it does not damage the property of others. In particular, taxation and theft are among the greatest evils possible as they involve coercion against justly held property. They agree with John Adams that the moment that idea is admitted into society that property is not as sacred as the laws of God and that there is not a force of law and public justice to protect it, anarchy and tyranny commence. Property must be sacred or liberty cannot exist. But... In their celebration of property as the source of liberty, they ignore the fact that private property is a source of tyranny in itself. Note that anarchists only object to private property here, not individual possession, nor usage rights. However, as much as anarchists may disagree about other matters, they are united in condemning private property. Thus, Proudhon argued that property was theft and despotism, while Stirner indicated the religious and status nature of private property and its, and its impact on individual liberty. He even wrote as such, quote, Property in the civic sense means sacred property, such that I must respect your property, be it ever so little. If one only has somewhat of his own, to wit, a respected property, the more such owners, the more free people and good patriots has the state. Political liberalism, like everything religious, counts on respect, humaneness, the virtues of love. For in practice, people respect nothing, and every day the small possessions are bought up again, uh, again by greater proprietors, and the free people change into day laborers. Page 248 of the Ego in its own. Thus, so-called anarcho-capitalists reject totally one of the common and so defining features of all anarchist traditions— the, opposi uh, the opposition to capitalist property. From individualist anarchists like Tucker to communist anarchists like Bookchin, anarchists have been opposed to what Godwin termed accumulated property. This was because it was in direct contradiction to property in the form of the produce of his, the worker's own industry, and so it allows one man to dispose of the produce of another man's industry. The Anarchist Reader, page 129 to 131. Thus, for anarchists, capitalist property is a source of exploitation and domination, not freedom. It undermines the freedom associated with possession by creating relations of domination between owner and employee. Hardly surprising, then, the fact that, according to Murray Bookchin, Murray Rothbard, quote, attacked me, Bookchin, as an anarchist with vigor because, as he put it, I'm opposed to private property. The Raven, number 29, page 343, for that interview. We will discuss Rothbard's homesteading justification of property in the next section. However, we will note here one aspect of right libertarian defense of unrestricted property rights, namely that it generates evil side effects such as hierarchy and starvation. As a famine expert, Armatya Sen notes, quote, Take a theory of entitlements based on a set of rights of ownership, transfer, and rectification. In this system, a set of holdings of different people are judged to be just or unjust by looking at past history and not by checking the consequences of that set of holdings. But what if the consequences are recognizably terrible? Referring to some empirical findings in a work on famines, evidence is presented to indicate that in a large many famines in recent past, in which millions of people have died, there was no overall decline in food availability at all, and that the famines occurred precisely because of shifts in entitlement resulting from exercises of rights that were perfectly legitimate. Can famines occur within a system of rights of the kind morally defended in various ethical theories, including, including Nozick's? 
I believe the answer is straightforwardly yes. Since for many people, the only resource that they legitimately possess, their labor power, may well turn out to be unsaleable in the market, giving the person no command over food. If results such as starvations and famines were to occur, would the distribution of holdings still be morally accept acceptable despite their disastrous consequences? There's something deeply implausible in the, affirm in the affirmative answer. Resources, Values, and Development, pages 311 to 312. Thus, unrestricted property rights can have seriously bad consequences, and so the existence of justly held property need not imply a just or free society. Far from it. The inequalities property can generate can have, a serious, uh, can have serious impact on individual freedom. See more of this in Chapter 3, Section 1. Indeed, Murray Rothbard argued that the state was evil not because it restricted individual freedom, but because the resources it's cl it claimed to own were not justly acquired. Thus, right libertarian theory judges property not on its impact on current freedom, but by looking at its past history. This has the interesting side effect of allowing its supporters to look at capitalist and status hierarchies, acknowledge their similar negative effects on the liberty of those subjected to them, but argue that one is legitimate and the other is simply not because of their history. If this changed the domination and unfreedom that both inflict on people living today, see section, uh, chapter 2, section 3 for further discussions, and section, uh, section eight, uh, chapter 2, section 8, and chapter 4, section 2 for other examples of justly acquired property producing terrible consequences, the defense of capitalist property does not have one interesting side effect, uh, does have one interesting side effect, namely, the need arises to defend inequality and the authoritarian relationship inequality creates. In order to protect the private property needed by capitalists in order to continue exploiting the working class, these so-called anarcho-capitalists propose private security forces rather than state security forces, such as police and military, a proposal that is equivalent to bringing back the state under another name. Due to capitalist private property, wage labor would still exist under their so-called anarcho-capitalism. It is capitalism, after all. This means that defensive force, a state, is required to defend exploitation, oppression, hierarchy, and authority from those who suffer them. Inequality makes a mockery of free agreement and consent. Chapter 3, Section 1. As Peter Kropokin uh, pointed out long ago, quote, when a workman sells his labor to an employer, it is a mockery to call that a free contract. Modern economists may call it free, but the father of political economy, Adam Smith, was never guilty of such a mis misrepresentation. As long as three quarters of humanity are compelled to enter into agreements of that description, force is, of course, necessary, both to enforce the supposed agreements and to maintain such a state of things. Force, and a good deal of force, is necessary to prevent the laborers from taking possession of what they consider unjustly appropriated by the few. The Spencerian party, proto-right libertarians, perfectly well understand that, and while they advocate no force for changing the existing conditions, they advocate still more force than is now used for maintaining them. As to anarchy, it is obviously as incompatible with plutocracy as any, kind, any other kind of ocracy. Anarchism and anarchist communism, pages 52 and 53. Because of this need to defend privilege and power, so-called anarcho-capitalism is the best is best called private state capitalism. This will be discussed more in, in chapter six. By advocating private property, right libertarians contradict many of their other claims. For example, they say that they can support the right of individuals to travel where they like. They make this claim because they assume that the only uh, that only the state limits free travel. But this is a false assumption. Owners must agree to let you on their land or property. Quote, people only have the right to move to those properties and lands where the owners desire to rent or sell to them. This is Rothbard in The Ethics of Liberty, page 119. There is no freedom of travel onto private property, including private roads, which there will be many of under this system. Therefore, immigration may be just as hard under these so-called anarcho-capitalist systems as it is under statism. After all, the state, like the property owner, only lets people in whom it wants to let in. 
people will still have to get another property owner to agree to let them in before they can travel. Exactly as now. And of course, they'll also have to get the owners of the road to let them in as well. Private property can be seen from this simple example. Is the small writ, uh, is the state writ small? One last point. This ignoring of politically incorrect, economic, and other views of dead political thinkers and activists while claiming them as libertarians seems to be commonplace in the right libertarian circles. For example, Aristotle, beloved by Ayn Rand, thought that, quote, only living things could bear fruit. Money is not a living thing, was by its nature barren, and any attempt to make it bear fruits, tokos in Greek, the same word used for interest, was a crime against nature. Such opposition to interest hardly fits well within uh, well into capitalism, and so either goes unmentioned or gets classed as an error. Although we could ask why Aristotle is an error while Rand is not. Similarly, individualist anarchist opposition to capitalist property and rent and interest and profit is ignored or dismissed as bad economics without realizing that these ideas played a key role in their politics and ensuring that an anarchy would not see, uh, would not see freedom corrupted by inequality. To ignore such an important concept in a person's ideas is to distort the remaining into something it just is not. <laughs> 